thank you everyone for coming. Uh, what else is there to do on a beautiful San Diego <laughs> afternoon <laughs> to talk about political scandal? Uh, which, you know, went away with Watergate. We solved all that. <laughs> and, you know, so I, now we get to go back through memory lane and, and remember everything. I'd like to start with a little bit about my background. Who am I? How did I get to be you know, 25 years old on the staff of the, what turned out to be the biggest congressional investigation in modern history? I think it still is today. So far. Yeah, so, so far. So far. <laughs> um, well, I was uh, just got, as Stanley mentioned, I had just graduated from uh, Emory University Law School. I'm a southerner. I'm from Asheville, North Carolina, the mountains of North Carolina. And I had gone to undergrad at Chapel Hill, University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. And uh, I had always been intrigued with the notion of coming to Washington. And as a kid, uh, you know, I was debated in high school, did a lot of political things. And I uh, was fortunate enough to have been selected by my congressman when I was 16 years old to go to the New Page in the House of Representatives. And so I spent the summer of my junior year as a page in the house. I wasn't able to d do what Arthur Lipper, or my friend, did. He, he went to page school <laughs> and when he was working for the notorious Bobby Baker. <laughs> and actually, I could have gone to school there, I think, but I wanted to, I was a kid, I wanted, at my point, I wanted to stay, stay uh, back in Asheville and do sports and all that stuff. But it was an amazing experience, a little, a little preamble. Uh, it, was, it was so interesting that, you know, this was in the summertime in 1963. I lived on the third floor of a walk-up townhouse on Capitol Hill with no air conditioning. <laughs> so I was thrilled every day to put on my suit and go to work because they had air conditioning. <laughs> and one day, uh, my friend, who was the chief page, his girlfriend was Lucy Baines Johnson, Lyndon Johnson's daughter. And he had to do something. I don't even remember what it was, but he had concert tickets to, to take Lucy to the Carter Baron Amphitheater to, to a concert. And he said, I can't go, would you take her? I said, is the, is the car air conditioned? <laughs> and he laughed. So sure enough, this black limo came, it's summertime, it's still six o'clock, it's 99 degrees and 99% humidity, and I was rushed in the car. And I went over to the house, which at that point, there was not a vice presidential residence. It was a house in Spring Valley in Washington, D.C. I rang the doorbell, and Lady Bird answers the door. You're 16 years old, and oh I walk in and sit down, and she's talking to me, and Lucy's getting ready, and, and then this big guy comes in, <laughs> and it's LBJ. And he, he's the vice president, and he, you know, I'm a little awed, and he, he shakes my hand, and he says, your name, what's your name? He said, Barry Shockett. He says, Shockett? He said, what kind of a name is that? I just said, it's French. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to go there. <laughs> and uh, we went off to Carter Baron Amphitheater, had a great time, saw the Kingston Trio. Yeah. And this new comedian from New York, his first appearance ever, a guy named Woody Allen. <laughs> and times were so sweet back then when Lucy and I walked into Carter Baron Amphitheater, people stood up and applauded. It was just, it was all other world. Anyway, so I, I was intrigued with Washington. So when I got a call one day in January 1973 from a friend of mine who I had known at Chapel Hill, who was a little bit older than me, we knew each other from student government. He had the wonderful name of Rufus Edmiston. And he was Senator Sam Irvin's staff director. And he said, uh, you know, Barry, I know you've always wanted to come to Washington. I remember that. Uh, would you be interested in coming up and working on this committee to look into the, this break-in? And, I, you know, I was thrilled. I said, sure. I went back. I called my girlfriend at the time. I said, I'm, I'm going to go to Washington. You want to come with me? She said, no. And I said, <laughs> That seals the deal. So I packed up everything, drove up to Washington, got an apartment, which incredulously turned out to be across the street from Bob Halberman. Oh. I used to see him every day, so we'll get to that a little later. Uh, and 
in, in Watergate started. I'm going to first, before I get into the details of what I did and what we did on the committee, I want to take us through the Watergate timeline so we can kind of remember everything. We can do this pretty quickly, but mm -hmm. it's a good exercise. It was 45 years ago. Remember these names, who they did, what they did, and when. So I'm going to, got some notes, I'm going to run through it pretty quickly. So we all remember on June 12th, uh, June 17th, 1972, five men, one of whom used to work for the CIA, are arrested at 2.30 in the morning trying to bug the offices of the Democratic National Committee at the Watergate office complex in Washington. On August 1st that year, the Washington Post reported that a $25,000 cashier's check, apparently earmarked for the Nixon campaign, wound up in the bank account of one of the Watergate burglars. Washington Post then reported on September 29th that John Mitchell, while serving as Attorney General, had controlled a secret fund used to finance widespread intelligence gathering operations against the Democrats. And then on October 10th, a few weeks later, the Washington Post further reported that FBI agents established that the Watergate break-in stemmed from a massive campaign of political spying and espionage conducted on behalf of the Nixon re-election effort. November the 11th, Nixon was re-elected. It was the largest landslide in American political history. He got over 60% of the vote, beating George McGovern. On January 30th of 73, things started to heat up. There had been all these reports in the Washington Post. Remember, we were all interested in it. I was on my way to Washington. January 30th, Gordon Liddy and James McCord, two of the burglars, actually had a trial and they were convicted of conspiracy, burglary, and wiretapping. And five other uh, Cubans who were involved with them pled guilty. So on February 5th, the Senate, uh, there was a Senate resolution which was approved 77 to nothing to establish the Senate Select Committee on Presidential Campaign Activities. And that was the Senate Watergate Committee. So our committee had a complete 77 to zero vote to go ahead and uh, start investigations. That committee consisted, you may remember, of four Democrats and three Republicans. It was chaired by <coughs> Senator Irvin from North Carolina the second person uh, in charge as a Democrat was Senator Herman Talmadge from Georgia. Then there was uh, Senator Daniel Inouye from Hawaii and Senator Joseph Montoya from New Mexico. The Republicans had three. They had Senator Howard Baker from Tennessee. <clears throat> and we had um, Senator Ed Gurney from Florida and Senator Laurel Weicker from Connecticut. Senator Weicker is the only surviving senator and we had a staff reunion uh, in June to celebrate the 45th anniversary of the break-in, and Senator Weicker was there. I'll get to that a little bit later. He was, he was wonderful. He was physically not in great shape, but he was on a panel, and he was completely with it. Funny, just, just like the way he always was. Um, we had three areas of investigation. First was the Watergate break-in and the cover-up. The second was political espionage, which we called dirty tricks. And the third was illegal campaign financing practices. Now on March 23rd of, oh, and by the way, also in February, very importantly, Elliot Richardson had been appointed Attorney General by President Nixon. At the Senate Judiciary Committee hearings, Senator Irvin made it a condition of his confirmation that he appoint a special prosecutor. And he did appoint a special prosecutor, Archibald Cox, which gets interesting in a couple of minutes. <laughs> so on March 23rd, James McCord, former CIA guy, one of the burglars, sent a letter to Judge John Sirica, who you may remember was the judge in charge of the Watergate proceedings in civil court, in criminal court, he sent a letter to Judge Sirica at the sentencing of the Watergate 7, stating that the break-in was not a CIA operation and that there had been political pressure from John Dean and John Mitchell for them to stay silent. 
Now that just kind of blew everything out of the water. What was interesting was we were preparing to start our hearings in May. This is the end of March. So every, you know, the media, everyone knew that this was getting ready to happen. And the senators, we were trying to gin up media interest. No one was really interested in the congressional hearings at that point because there's a bunch of guys that pleaded guilty to a break-in. There were rumors that Moore was involved, but nah, you know, public television was going to carry it, but nobody else was going to carry it. Then, on April 30th, Nixon's top staffers, Alderman John Ehrlichman and Attorney General Richard Kleindienst resigned over the scandal, and John Dean was fired. Everything changed. The media was at our doorstep, and they decided that when we would put on our hearings, <clears throat> they would carry it gavel to gavel, all three networks and public television. And you may remember back then, that's all the TV there was. <laughs> there was no other television. So, you know, we were it. It does get a little interesting, however, and I'll get to this in a second. Our hearings began on May 17th, and they lasted till August 7th. And as, as I said, they were covered gavel to gavel every day by the media. We had lower level people. We were building up witnesses. Uh, but our first major witness was John Dean. And on June 3rd, John Dean gave a written statement for the committee, which lasted from 10 o'clock in the morning until 6 o'clock in the afternoon. Eight hour statement. But we knew what he was going to say because we had, you know, interviewed him extensively. But it galvanized the hearings in the country. He stated that the president's top assistants and the president himself were totally involved in the break in and the cover up. And he stated that he met with the president personally to discuss the cover up 35 times. Yeah. Now that blew everything out of the water, you may remember. But it was only a statement from him and the media the White House had its media followers at the time people who were sympathetic to them they included Bill Sapphire in the New York Times Joe Alsop in the Washington Post and they came out and attacked the committee savagely and they said no this is a charade it shouldn't happen it was only a small thing the Dean is trying to save himself don't pay any attention to this so we had a whole series of, of uh, witnesses, which I'll get into in a minute with, with my role. I'm just giving you the big overall timeline. On July 13th, Alexander Butterfield came with, to us and in an interview that I was not present at that interview, but I was four doors down the hall. He inadvertently disclosed, if he's been here, he's probably told you this, but he inadvertently disclosed the fact that the White House had a taping system that taped all these conversations and phone calls. And that was on a Friday, and he was supposed to go to Russia because at that time he was the chairman of the Federal Aviation Administration, was supposed to be meeting in Russia, and we pleaded with him to stay in the country and give testimony, which he was very nervous to do, but he did it, so on Monday, 16th of July, he gave the testimony about the tapes, and of course that blew everything out of the water, that changed the nature of everything. Again, we'll finish with the timeline, we'll zip through it. On July 23rd, now we had asked the President through a whole series of negotiations to turn over the tapes. Senator Irvin even went to the White House and had a meeting with the President, and asked him to turn over the tapes. The President said, I can't do it, I'll, I'll give you I'll give you an edited version of the tapes. We'll send them to Senator, uh, to, let's see, Senator Stennis, I believe it was, and he will look at it and he'll review it and whatever is relevant, we'll do. And Senator Irvin said, no, we can't do that. So it was a, a loggerhead. He refused to turn the tapes over to our committee or to the special prosecutor. On October 10th, Vice President Agnew resigned. Um, on October 25th, 73, you had the Saturday Night Massacre in which Nixon ordered Attorney General Richardson to fire the Special Prosecutor Archibald Cox, and he didn't do it, so Richardson resigned. And from February 74 to April 74, he started getting indictments against Haldeman, Ehrlichman, Charles Colson, and others. 
And it went on and on and on. These guys were indicted, the trials were getting ready to proceed. And finally, on July 24th, the Supreme Court ordered that President Nixon turn over the tapes. This was in 1974. You had to do it. At the same month, the House passed three uh, articles of impeachment. In early August, the last straw happened. The previously unknown tape from June of 1972 documented Nixon and Haldeman formulating a plan to block the investigations. This tape was nicknamed the smoking gun. That was it. On August 9th, the president <laughs> resigned. So all in all, 69 people were indicted. 48 either pled guilty or found guilty of involvement in the Watergate scandal. And that was the timeline. So as I mentioned, the Watergate involved, our investigation involved a number of different things. It involved the break-in, the cover-up, the break-in. It involved the financial improprieties that involved political investigations. It all started, actually, people may not, you may not remember this, but there was a group that Nixon had prior to his reelection called the Plumbers Unit. Uh, G. Gordon Liddy was in it. Um, and they broke into the offices of Daniel Ellsberg, psychiatrist. You remember Ellsberg was the Pentagon uh, defense analyst who leaked these papers to the New York Times. That was the first early activity that this, this White House did to try to stop uh, leaks that it felt was injurious to it. And of course, in the campaign financing, uh, there was, it turned out that there was a huge slush fund that was created by the committee to reelect the president. It involved John Mitchell, who was the chairman of the committee. It involved Jeb Magruder, who was the committee's deputy director. And its finance director, Marie Stans, who directed that funds would be given to Liddy for many nefarious activities. So the hearings began on May 17th. We had spent a lot of time between early March, when we really got going, and May, setting up all of the witnesses. We subpoenaed them. We had subpoena power. We would bring them in, and we would interview them. Uh, some of them, it would just like probably any other major investigation, some witnesses were very cooperative, some stonewalled, some were scared to death, some were down from New York. And then there were five of us who were lawyers under those three senior guys. The three senior guys and on the Democratic side, which I was, and Fred Thompson, and his assistance on the Republican side, uh, those four would be the ones who would interview the most prominent witnesses. The rest of us interviewed most all of the other witnesses. But <coughs> right after the interviews happened, <coughs> the interviewees, the interviewers, would come and discuss in detail everything that was said with the remaining staff lawyers of which I was one. So we heard about how everything went with these major players. John Ehrlichman was very, very uh, pleasant. He didn't remember anything, of course. <laughs> he smiled, he made jokes, everything was made light of. This was after they resigned, by the way. Um, Haldeman uh, was tougher. He was, he was uh, told to be polite, but basically stonewalled everything. John Dean came forth with everything. And Dean was really the person who uh, I think was the most important single figure in the, in, the, in the entire investigation because he, for a variety of reasons, and he's been here too, so I'm, I'm at a bit of a disadvantage, but from our perspective, <clears throat> Dean, I think, felt that what he had done was wrong. He was certainly trying to protect himself and reduce his sentence, which worked. He only got, I think, four months uh, reduced sentence at a, at a very, very minimum security prison near Baltimore, but he really felt that, that he had to come clean about everything that had happened. And, uh, and, and so when 
when the staff interviewed him and it was portrayed down to us, he was somebody, again, remember, his statement was eight hours long. So we had days of interrogations with him in which he laid out everything that he laid out into his statement. This would have been in April of 73, and we knew, we knew it, I'm sorry, in May of 73, because he testified in early June, and we knew at that point that there was really, uh, there was really a serious situation here that was, that, was, that was going to lead to something major. It was interesting, back then, there was not a lot of partisanship the way we see it today. Our staffs got along very, very well. <coughs> There were differences, I mean, but, but it was not like we, the Democrats, were out to get Richard Nixon. It really wasn't like that back then. Remember, I was 25 years old. I was basically out to have a wonderful time in Washington, meet a lot of girls, work very hard, and, 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 and you know, make a piece of history. The Republican staff, from their point of view, um, was, was quite cooperative. Now, they did little things to try to slow the investigation, to try to limit the number of witnesses. Uh, we, uh, John Dean wanted immunity. He wanted full immunity before he would testify before the committee. But we couldn't give it to him. All we could do is give him what's called use immunity. We could give him immunity for the things that he said uh, publicly and privately to us in the terms of the investigation. But that's all we could give him immunity for. If uh, the special prosecutor had found that there were uh, other ways to get testimony from him or evidence against him that could be used against him, it could be used against him. Interestingly, he was one of the people that created a statute that created use immunity, so he kind of messed himself up because before that statute was created, he could have had full immunity. Now, it gets really interesting uh, for, from us in this perspective. This is something that most people probably have forgotten. Archibald Cox was appointed special prosecutor. He really did not want us to have the hearings at all. We had a lot of meetings, and I was in some of them with Cox and his staff. And they said, look, if you go forward with these hearings, we can't have these prosecutions. You know, you're going to go on national television. All of this stuff is going to come out. It's going to completely damage our prosecution. Senator Irvin and all the other senators felt strongly, even the Republican senators felt strongly, that this was such an important national matter that it had to be aired publicly, and that Congress had to be the organization that would do it. That if it were left only to the special prosecutor, as you see today in any special prosecuting, special counsel situation, you, the public doesn't get any information. It's very, very quiet. Nothing happens until the very end, and unless it happens through leaks. So we wanted a full public accounting as to what was going on. Cox felt so strongly about it that he actually sued our committee. And there was a trial before Judge Sirica again uh, in May as to whether or not uh, we could go forward with these hearings. He wanted the hearings to be delayed for at least 90 days. And Senator Irvin basically said, you know, 90 days is like the, the sound of Gabriel's trumpet. Uh, it, it, trailing off in the end, it will never go away. And we won, of course, and we were able to proceed with, with the hearings. But the special prosecutor's office did not want us to have those hearings. And if the court had found otherwise, we wouldn't have had the hearings. Um, this is something that, you know, people have forgotten because it wasn't, uh, wasn't really laid out all that well. The staffs of the committee were split. This is interesting, as, as I've noted, there was not a lot of a partisan divide, but there was a, a divide, a great divide between the staff that Senator Urban hired and the staff that Sam Dash hired. Sam Dash hired people, not, not the top three lawyers, but the he will, under him and other investigators under him were basically hired from Ivy League schools and, and uh, there were a couple of New York cops. It was a wonderful investigator who was part of the Serpico squad. He was a great friend of mine, Mike Hirschman. Called him Superfly. Great guy. <laughs> but the Southerners who Senator Urban hired, of which I was one, 
And the Ivy League crowd that Sam Irvin, that Sam Dash hired, uh, there was a tremendous amount of tension. And I would argue that the tension was mainly brought about by, by the other guys, not by us. <laughs> it got so bad that there was, a, there was a major meeting that no one knows about. There was a big meeting. Um, Sam Irvin called in Sam Dash, Rufus Edmiston was there, and I was there, a few of the staff people that were there. And Senator Irvin said, look, I've heard all about this. It's got to end. If it doesn't end, Sam, you and your staff are gone. He, he actually protected us, which I was a little surprised. And Sam Urban went to Harvard. He was not a, unfamiliar with the Ivy League. But, but we were a little bit uh, trampled on. And, and that really pulled it together because, it, you know, like any other organization, you have organizational rifts. And early on in, in these committee hearings, that was the potential to blow the whole organization apart. Um, so that was, kind of, that was kind of a crazy thing. The hearings themselves were pretty amazing. You may remember they, they went from mid-May to August 7th, I think, was the last day. It was summer in Washington. It was very hot. It was in the Russell Office Building Senate Caucus Room, which is a very, very historic room. It was the room in which the Teapot Dome scandal hearings were held. It was the room in which the McCarthy hearings were held. Uh, it, it, it's a very large room, but when packed, when packed with media, with television lights, uh, with people who were able to come in and watch, with all of the staff, it got incredibly hot. Um, it was you know, probably 90 degrees in, in the middle of the day. and. Um, there was a tremendous amount of uh, attention. Obviously, we were we were very very tired. We walked we worked 12 to 14 hours a day. I was specifically assigned to Senator Herman Talmadge. I want to tell you a little bit about him because he's he was quite a character. He was a, a television character. He was like a benign Frank Underwood. If anyone of you watched <laughs> House of Cards, he was he was a good guy, but he was a, a very very smooth southern politician. <coughs> he smoked a big cigar. He chewed tobacco. His office was so smoothly run that <clears throat> he had a wonderful system. If, if, you, if you called into his office to speak to him, he would have a system set up where the receptionist would pick up the phone and let's say you were Mr. Jones from Atlanta and you had a, a veterans problem. If he was in the office, no matter what he was doing, the receptionist would punch a line and get the veteran's aid on standby, and he'd punch you through to Senator Talmadge. Senator Talmadge would pick up the phone no matter what he was doing, and he would say, he would know, he would say, Mr. Jones in Atlanta, how are you doing? I understand you have a veteran's problem. I'm gonna turn you on to Mr. Smith, my veteran's aid. I'm gonna take care of you, have a good day. <laughs> you spoke to Herman Talmadge. I mean, Herman Talmadge spoke to you. You didn't speak to him, so he was brilliant. The, the, the lore in Georgia was, if, if you were a puppy dog and your last name ended in Talmadge, you could get elected. Georgia. <laughs> and uh, he had an amazing work ethic. He was a farmer. His father was governor, but they were farmers. And even in the middle of a hot Washington summer, he would go to sleep about 7.30, 8 o'clock at night. He'd wake up at 1 o'clock in the morning and go jogging outside of his apartment building, which even back then was insane. And about 2.30, 3 o'clock in the morning, he would call me up and he'd say, come on over, I'm going to have a big country breakfast and we'll prepare for the day. So we would start about 3 o'clock in the morning <laughs> and go till you know, 6, 7 o'clock at night. For him, it was nothing. He was used to it. For, for me, even at 25 years old, it was, it was a little daunting. Uh, and, and there were ways that I ended it, but I can't get into that because it's on, we're being recorded. <laughs> but he was the ranking member after uh, Senator Irvin on the Democratic side. And it turned out, I didn't know this until years later, 
<clears throat> but Rufus Edmondson told me that Senator Irvin wouldn't take the chairmanship of the committee unless Herman Talmadge were a member. So Rufus went to Herman and, 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 and tried to talk him into it, and he was very, very reluctant. <clears throat> and then Rufus remembered that I was working for a law firm in Atlanta that the head of the law firm was a good friend of Senator Talmadge. So he happened to be in Asheville, in my hometown, and he went to my parents' store. He was friendly with my parents. Rufus went on to become the Attorney General of North Carolina, Secretary of State and Attorney General. He was, he was quite a figure in North Carolina, he still is. And he was always, you know, in every town he went to, he'd go in and shake hands with everybody. So he was with my folks, and he said, is Barry still practicing at a law firm in Atlanta? Yes. So he contacted the head of the law firm, who was a friend of Herman Talmadge, and said, would you mind if this young guy uh, comes and works for me? And I don't think the head of the law firm even knew who I was. I was only there for like six months. He said, no problem. So, so he said, OK, I've got somebody from this, from this Atlanta law firm who will help you. And he said, fine, I'll, I'll come in and, and work for the committee. But um, we had one fascinating interchange that you may remember if you were junkies for the Watergate Committee. Um, Robert Klein actually cut a section of a CD based on this exchange of questioning that I put forward. Maurice Stans was the finance head of the Committee to Re-elect the President. I did a little research on Maurice Stans and I found out that he was a member of the Certified Public Accountants Hall of Fame. So he came before us and, uh, you know, $20 million over time, over a year, year and a half, maybe two years, went from the committee to reelect the president to all of these different activities. And we just started in on questioning, do you remember where this $2 million went? No idea. Do you remember where this $4 million went? No idea. Do you remember where this $5 million went? No idea. So the Senator Talmadge just held up his book. I have in my hand a copy of the Certified Public Accountants Hall of Fame. And here you remember, and you can't tell us where $20 million is. <laughs> um, wow. And Robert Klein actually <coughs> cut a, a, a track based on that. I saw him last year in San Francisco at a, at a show he was giving. And I went up to him and I said, Mr. Klein, you owe me some royalties for your taxes. <laughs> <laughs> I told him the story, it was, it was terrific. Another thing that, uh, that, that we did, that Senator Talmadge and I did that was interesting was the chief investigator for the committee was an amazing guy, his name was Carmine Bellino. He had been uh, a senior assistant to Robert Kennedy and to John Kennedy. He was a congressional investigator for 30 years. He was a CPA, he was a brilliant guy, and he was our chief investigator. But um, one day, the chairman of the Republican National Committee, George Bush Sr., charged that Carmine was involved in bugging Republicans during the 1960 presidential campaign and demanded that he be taken off the committee. And he was our chief investigator, and he was brilliant. And the next day, 22 Republican senators had a letter demanding that he be taken off of the uh, investigation. So there was a crisis, um, and Senator Irvin and Senator Baker appointed Senator Talmadge to be the, uh, I don't know if this is sticking under, under him or not, to, that's Sam Dash, to, be, to have a subcommittee. Um, investigating whether or not there was a problem with Carmine Bellino. And so I was given the task of heading that subcommittee from a staff point of view, and we did an investigation that lasted uh, a couple of months, and we found out that the charges were completely spurious. But he was taken off for three or four months, and it was, it was, it was a pretty sad thing. One wonderful thing that, that the staff had, uh, was able to do in the investigation was establish great and interesting relationships with the media, the media people of the day. Of course, they would come to us all the time for leaks, any information that we could give them. And we, you know, we, we couldn't leak any substantive information. That would be crazy. We'd get back 
pretty quickly and we'd be gone. But we would try to point them in certain directions and give them, you know, a little bit of uh, analysis as to what to look for, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, we, so I establish relationships that, that last to this day with people like Leslie Stahl, whom we had at our, at our uh, reunion. She, she led a panel of uh, Senator Weicker and, <coughs> and Rufus and a couple of others. Uh, Marvin Kalb, Connie Chung, Bob Schieffer um, are my friends to this day, and we had we had wonderful relationships with them. And, and again, at the time, one thing that, that just strikes me so much is is the lack of compared today, compared with today, the lack of partisanship, the lack of anger, the lack of on both sides. People just they got along so much better. The senators from both sides uh, socialized together. And, and, and when we were in committee meetings and the senators